Good morning. I'm Brent Rusin, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. Today I have the sad duty of announcing Manitoba's first death related to COVID-19. It is my understanding that this was the client previously noted to be in intensive care. Our condolences go out to their friends and family. Today we're announcing three new cases as of 9.30 a.m. this morning, bringing our total cases to 39. Public health investigations are continuing to confirm the details on those new individuals. As of yesterday, 6,203 tests for COVID-19 have been completed at Cadham Provincial Lab. Yesterday, 606 tests were performed. Today, I'm issuing updated orders under the Public Health Act. Effective at 12.01 a.m., Monday, March 30th, we'll be limiting public gatherings of no more than 10 people at any indoor or outdoor place or premises. This includes places of worship, gatherings or family events such as weddings and funerals. This does not apply to a facility where health care or social services are provided, uh, including child care centers and homeless shelters. Retail businesses, including grocery and food stores, shopping centers, pharmacies, and gas stations must ensure separation of one to two meters between patrons assembling in their business. Public transportation facilities must also ensure that people assembling at the facility are reasonably able to maintain a separation of one to two meters uh, from each other. Other restrictions first introduced in the public health order on March 20th remain in effect. I want to reiterate that now is a time for social and physical distancing. We know there's much fear uh, of this virus, but we know that fear can be contagious and the use of credible information can guide our way forward. We can be hopeful that we actually have strategies in place right now that all Manitobans uh, can put in to limit the spread of this virus. We can protect ourselves, we can protect the people around us, we can protect our community by practicing social distancing. If you can, stay home. Wash your hands frequently. Certainly stay home if you're sick. If you're out, try to maintain that one to two meters between other people. This will dramatically decrease the risk of transmitting this virus. The time to implement these strategies was two weeks ago, but if you haven't yet, it's not too late. You can protect yourself and others starting today. Please do not wait to see if an order applies to you. Orders are just one method of us getting that message out and ensuring that we can enforce these strategies. But whether or not this order directly applies to you, start now. Social distancing strategies, protect yourself, protect our community, protect our healthcare workers who are at the front line. Any person concerned about their exposure or risk of having COVID-19 should call Health Links Info Santé to be screened to see if a test is required. Moving forward, the province will continue to share updates on the total number of cases in our media bulletins and our daily news conferences. Additional patient, patient information such as gender, age, and the regional health authority where they live will be provided online once it is confirmed through public health investigation. The province is also working to provide an additional breakdown of information online, including the number of hospitalizations and recoveries. This reporting is in line uh, with reporting in other jurisdictions and it uh, ensures accurate data is available to the public. I want to thank all Manitobans who have stepped up in our battle against this virus. We know now is the time for action. Now is not the time for business as usual. Uh, we need to enhance our social distancing strategies. But again, this is not a time for dismay. We are not helpless. We have these strategies in place which will protect our community against this virus. So thank you to everyone who stepped up. 
and I know more and more Manitobans are going to be doing their part to limit the spread of this virus. So thank you very much. I'll pass it to Lynette. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Lynette Siragusa from Shared Health, the provincial lead for health system integration and quality, as well as the chief nursing officer. I would like to begin today by thanking Red River Community College. The college has been a wonderful partner to us throughout the COVID-19 um, planning efforts. They Last week I announced that they had donated some of their advertising time for us so we will use put that to good use to make sure that public messaging is out there. Uh, as well today I'm happy to announce that the college's safety and health services department has donate, donated nearly 1,795 masks um, these will be distributed among frontline healthcare workers and further bolsters our supply of uh, personal protective equipment for our staff. Additionally, 14 health information management students at the college have joined our epidemiology and surveillance department. So there, those students will be assisting uh, our efforts to track the virus here in Manitoba. So on behalf of all healthcare workers in our province, I'd like to express our deepest gratitude and thanks to Red River College for their meaningful donation and support. Uh, on to operational matters for today. HealthLinks yesterday received a record of 2,560 calls. The average wait time was 18 minutes and technology was installed this morning to add hundreds more lines to health links and eliminate the busy signal that people were sometimes getting. So we hope that issue has been resolved. We understand there's the capacity to handle much more calls and uh, wait times and busy signals should be done. Our online assessment tool, both the English and French versions, have had nearly 306,000 views since their launch. So that's great. Um, community sites. So the new community testing drive through site opened today in Portage La Prairie and in Ericsdale. The Portage La Prairie site is at the Stride Center, which is located at 245 Royal Road. Hours are daily from 9 till 3. The Ericsdale site is at the Community Wellness Centre, which is located at 35 Railway Avenue. And the hours in Ericsdale are from 10 till 3, Monday to Friday. Uh, discussions are ongoing regarding the testing site in Dauphin. So I don't have an update on that at this time. Additional locations throughout the province will be opening in the next few days, including a drive through in Pine Falls that will be opening up on Monday. And we'll give you more information in the days ahead. As a reminder, Manitobans need to call health links to, re to receive instruction as to whether they need to be tested. And these testing sites are not walk-in clinics, so you do need to get referred to them. A couple of other updates I wanted to um, share. So as we mentioned yesterday, Dynacare has begun contacting individuals to report negative COVID-19 results. And for those who have been patiently waiting for their test results, the representation representatives from Dynacare will be clearly identifying themselves and the reason they're calling. They will ask several questions to confirm the, your identity, make sure that you're the person they want to talk to. So, uh, but we do want to be clear that these individuals from Dynacare who are calling to give you your lab results will never ask you for any credit card information or financial information. So please don't confuse our, our um, Dynacare staff. Uh, it will take a few days to work through this new process and catch up on that backlog. Um, Manitobans may sometimes receive more than one call. So just we ask you for your patience as we sort through this. Um, and reminder that those who are have tested positive for COVID-19 will receive an expedited phone call from public health. 
The other thing I wanted to talk to you about was contact tracing. Uh, contact tracing is obviously very essential to the work that we do in trying to contain COVID-19. After a positive case is found, public health officials will almost immediately contact that patient and get as many details as they can about where they've been and who they've, who they've seen. They will then be calling as many as up to 20 contacts, potentially more, um, to, to see who was they were in contact with over the last couple of weeks. Until now, regional public health programs have been contacting individuals who have had contact with other people tested positive for the virus. And as the number of positive cases increase, so too must the team to handle the, the contact tracing and surveillance. So I wanted to let you know um, that we are staffing up right now. Our human resource department is, is recruiting people to work in a centralized COVID uh, unit where they will do that contact tracing and surveillance. Uh, we have also um, upgraded our computer system so it will be able to track patients from the moment they test positive till they've recovered and anywhere in between if they are in a hospital or if they stay in the community. So it'll be a really um, streamlined, integrated process to uh, track our patients and their outcomes. Uh, we've trained up the staff the core staff on this new technology. We've ordered new computers and we will be opening this contact center next week in Deer Lodge, which is now a vacant space apart and separate from the patient care area. The center will mainly operate on a call-out basis with employees working off lists that are received from the central surveillance unit. Locating the center at Deer Lodge will allow employees to access the existing network and services, servers that we have, whether they're in the office or working from home. And it will also provide uh, sufficient space so that they can work and still be socially distanced. Uh, or physically distanced. Uh, the work this unit does is integral to limiting the spread of the virus, but they can't do it alone. And I would just remind everyone, it's up to all of us to um, practice social distancing and stay home if we're not feeling well. And finally, um, I did also just want to let you know, because it's coming up a lot, and I just want everyone to know that we are working on um, for individuals who uh, need to self-isolate but are not in a great position to self-isolate, whether it's their living condition or their family size, um, it's, it's really important to have that social distancing when, you're, uh, when you've been tested positive for COVID-19. And um, so in discussing with other jurisdictions, uh, we know this is actually a core part to containing containing this virus. So I just want Manitobans to know we are looking very closely at options. Uh, we've got some great opportunities we want to um, share with you soon to mitigate any close contact uh, spread during self-isolation. Um, and I will open up the lines to questions. Thank you. Just a reminder to the reporters online, you're allowed a primary question and a follow-up question. And then we'll see if time permits if we go to the second round. And please introduce yourselves fully before you ask your question. From CTV, Michelle. Hi, I'm just wondering if the death, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Like, was this related to the dental conference? in Vancouver that uh, some death of people from Manitoba attended? It was a death related to COVID-19, uh, but we're not going to be discussing any further details regarding the individual. And the three new cases, uh, can, you, can you tell us whether or not those are travel related and what you know about those cases? Right, so in our efforts to to report on cases uh, as soon as we uh, we can. We're often reporting on these before I have the public health investigations uh, back in front of me. 
So we reported those cases. The investigations are uh, have commenced and are ongoing, and we'll provide further information uh, online. From 102.9, Navi. Good morning. My question is for Lynette. Uh, you mentioned before that uh, the province is in partnership with uh, the U of M and Red River. Is the province also in contact with University College of the North nursing or healthcare aid uh, programs at this point? Yes, we are. Good question, Abby. So we've sent communication to all the um, for sure, all the universities and colleges. So that also includes University of Brandon and the, you know, the College of the North. Uh, just letting them know that we support students and we will make sure they have safe environments and um, mentorship if, uh, if they're wanting to come work during, during this time. Mm -hmm. um, and a quick question about the uh, uh, testing site. Uh, it mentions in the news release that it was relocated. Is there a particular reason for the relocation? Which site was relocated? Oh, uh, the Paw. Um, I am not sure why they chose to relocate it, but you know what, Abby, we can get back some details for you. Perfect. Thank you. From the Winnipeg Sun, Scott. Hello, it was Scott Bill from Winnipeg Sun. Um, uh, it's a question related to the death, uh, not related to the patient at all. Um, but just wondering, uh, obviously there's going to be an uptick in anxiety over this. What, what is the message to, to Manitobans right now um, after experiencing first death by way of COVID-19? Right, so... Um, the hearing this uh, tragic news uh, very likely may raise anxiety levels for many Manitobans. Uh, we want to ensure they're reaching out for credible information, going to uh, our um, manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 website for credible information. But uh, again, now is not the time for fear. Now is the time for action, right? Now is the time for our social distancing strategies. And so uh, it's, a, it's a tragic loss. It's a, it's a Manitoban that we lost. Um, and our hearts go out to their friends and family. Uh, but this is uh, our time to, to act now, um, to stay home if you can, practice good social distancing, wash your hands, for sure stay home when you're sick. Uh, all Manitobans have a role uh, to limit days like this. Uh, and I um, thank all Manitobans who have already stepped up, and I know there's going to be many, many more that are, that are stepping up now. Follow up a uh, question. Just um, does does today's death announcement uh, play any part in in the new restrictions on gatherings? And and, and if not, why why now? Um, why 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 was now the right time to do that? It wasn't. Uh, it, it didn't play a, a, a role in our in our decision as we were um, uh, creating this this order uh, prior to to knowledge of this uh, tragedy. But uh, now as we're, we're seeing increasing uh, transmission around us, we're seeing in Canada increase community-based transmission, um, and we know that that's uh, coming to Manitoba. Uh, and we know that we need to escalate our social distancing strategies. We need to increase our, our messaging. And this is just one tool that's available to us to, uh, to heighten that ur sense of urgency, the heighten that sense of the need for action. From CJOB, Clay. Dr. Rusin, uh, may, I, uh, may I ask if uh, the individual who died, did, did they have underlying medical conditions? I'm not going to uh, discuss specific specifics of that, uh, of that individual. I, I will say that in, in general, uh, the, the uh, risk factors for severe outcomes of COVID-19 include age over 65, include various underlying medical conditions, uh, as well as immune compromise. So um, I won't speak specifically about that, uh, that individual, however. Understand. 
just a quick uh, follow up. Uh, any of the uh, cases that we do now have, uh, is anyone in intensive care? Sorry, uh, right now, any? Uh, I'm not aware of any um, any other um, admissions uh, as of uh, 9:30 this morning uh, have not been reported to me. All right. Thank you. From Global, Marty. Um, Dr. Rusin, you said that you won't release any specifics about the patient. Um, can you just talk a little bit more about? why you won't do that because I'm sure some other Manitobans would want to know, you know, if they had contact with this person or if they traveled with this person. Can you talk a bit more about uh, why you won't uh, release that information or have you been in touch with people who may have been in close contact with this person? Right, so that's, that's long been done. So the, uh, as, as we state, as, as, as soon as we are, uh, receive a report of a case, even a probable case, public health uh, leaps into action and they uh, immediately ensure that individual is isolated. Uh, they then do an extensive contact investigation, which would include travel plans, which would include large group settings, and then reach out and communicate to uh, all of those contacts and have them self-isolating and monitoring symptoms uh, very closely. So the, the need to, uh, to announce publicly the um, specifics of any individual isn't, uh, uh, doesn't benefit the health of the public because we've already taken those steps. Um, and unrelated to uh, the individual um, who is now the first death, can you talk a little bit more about that dental conference in BC? We've had some concern about that. Are there any other uh, cases related to that? Um, can you confirm any details on that or have you been in touch with anybody who could have traveled to that conference? Well, we do know that in, in multiple jurisdictions, uh, there has been uh, confirmed cases from that, uh, from that conference. Uh, and uh, everyone who had attended at a conference had been notified of the need to, to self-isolate. And so um, we're well aware of it. We've uh, been following up with um, our typical approaches to cases and contact investigations. Um, but uh, I'm uh, not uh, discussing, you know, specifics of, of cases and, and their contacts. We've, uh, we investigate, we uh, reach out to close contacts uh, as appropriate, so we don't release to the, the public uh, the specific information. From City News, Stephanie. Uh, Dr. Rosen, Stephanie from City News. Just wondering if you can clarify what the province is doing to enforce the orders under the Public Health Act. Right, so uh, as of um, uh, last week when we first issued a public health order, the, uh, uh, the enforcement is largely following uh, proactive measures from our public health inspectors. Um, to visit uh, affected businesses to ensure they're complying, to ensure that they're uh, provided with uh, advice on how to comply. Um, we do have the ability under, the, uh, under typical processes to, uh, to force compliance. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, that in, in extreme cases, the, the Public Health Act makes it an offense to contravene an order, so there could be stricter penalties imposed. Uh, but right now, it's, it's reaching out to affected businesses, uh, providing assistance on how they can comply. Um, but uh, in order to protect the health of Manitobans, we can take further steps if required. Right. Can you just say how many inspectors are working on this or if people know that people are in contravention of these guidelines, where they can call or what they should be doing? There is, um, uh, as we have the uh, orders um, escalating, we're going to have uh, posted on our website an, an email that certain, uh, uh, that individuals could, uh, could utilize. Um, there's different um, uh, activities that, uh, uh, that might, uh, will, direct for uh, four or five different intake possibilities for people. So we're going to be posting that on our, insight, uh, on our website uh, for people to uh, be able to uh, uh, report uh, certain issues or have any questions. Uh, but again, a reminder is that, uh, you know, this is not about um, issuing fines. This is, a, is about Manitobans realizing uh, that now is the time for action, right? So these orders are just one tool. They're not our only tool. 
Um, they're, they're needed, they're in place, uh, and so we're going to utilize them. But we just want Manitobans to know that now is the time for action. Uh, if this order doesn't apply to you, it doesn't mean that social distancing strategies don't apply to you. Right? It's everyone's role to work on those right now. And I you know, send a thanks again to a lot of Manitobans who uh, I know are having a rough time with these measures. Uh, but together we're going to get uh, we're going to get through this. But we need everyone uh, working together. From CBC Radio Canada, Patrick. Yes, hi, Patrick Foucault, Radio Canada. Are we aware with these new cases if there is any uh, health worker uh, that is uh, that has been tested positive? I haven't been uh, received any uh, uh, reports from public health on that. Um, going forward, we're really um, going to be uh, disclosing things like age, gender, region of residence, uh, but we assure all Manitobans that uh, we do a very thorough public health investigation, reach out to contacts, uh, so if this includes um, a healthcare worker, we do an extensive contact investigation within um, any of the healthcare settings that they may have been in. And so the um, uh, release of that type of information uh, doesn't benefit the public, uh, but certainly we will be uh, doing thorough investigations and reaching out to all affected um, or possibly affected individuals. And I guess the next question would be for uh, Lynette. Um, do you have an idea of what the wait time is for the French Info uh, Santé services? Mm -hmm. Sorry, just one moment. Oh, okay. Uh, apparently, they had done some analysis, and the wait times for English and French uh, responses consistent. All right, thank you. Thanks. From the Winnipeg Free Press, Carol. Uh, hi, Dr. Wilson. Can you tell us more about the 10-person limit? Does that apply to all businesses? Does it apply to offices? Could you just be a little bit more specific about who it applies to? Right, so it's, it's an escalation of the first order from uh, last week. So at this point, it, um, it applies to public places and public gatherings. It doesn't apply uh, within workplaces. Uh, it doesn't um, apply to facilities where health care or social services are provided, which includes uh, child care centers and homeless shelters. Um, but again, um, for workplaces, this order right now may not uh, apply, uh, but the social distancing strategies do. Right? There's lots of things that uh, businesses can put in place now, ensuring that social separation between employees, doing what they can, uh, ensuring ability to frequently wash hands to clean surfaces, uh, possible uh, to have uh, workers work from home. Uh, so there's a lot of strategies uh, in place. Uh, I mentioned a number of times, make it easy for your employees to stay home when they're ill. Don't require them to get sick notes. Make it easy for your employees to self-isolate if they're directed to. If we don't make these things easy, then the risk is that uh, they won't self-isolate. And so this is that example. We, we all are in this together. We all have roles to play. We want people to self-isolate if you're advised to. Uh, now coming from international travel, it's not an option. We're not asking. It's a quarantine order. Uh, but let's do all of our parts to ensure that people have uh, reasonable options to do that. And my follow-up question is about um, not identifying positive cases uh, being healthcare workers. I'm just wondering how, maybe when I can answer this, but how do uh, the people working in contact tracing get in touch with all the people who might have had contact with the healthcare worker just because there's so many people that come and go from these facilities and surfaces are touched, but why not let people know uh, if a healthcare worker tests positive, just so anybody who might have been in that particular healthcare worker's workplace would, would 
be more careful and maybe self-isolate if they were at the same facility where this person was. Right, right. Yeah, so it's a good question. So if there is a case where we thought there was a number of contacts that, uh, that um, had prolonged close contact with a case and we weren't able to identify them, then we would absolutely do that. We would uh, list if someone was in this facility uh, from this time to this time, we'll do it. But remember that this is not like measles. This is not an airborne virus. This is only spread through sy uh, symptomatic individuals after prolonged close contact. So if this person was working in a certain facility, not everyone who's been in that facility needs to be um, co contacted. Only people who had close prolonged contact with this individual. So the, the uh, contact tracing, when you mention it, it, it does sound daunting, but this is, uh, like I said, the expertise of public health nurses. This is what they do for a living. So we don't, don't just do this contact tracing for, uh, for cases of COVID-19. Uh, they do this extremely well for other cases such as meningitis, where we need to urgently track down contacts and provide them with uh, treatment, in fact, uh, prophylaxis. So they do this all the time and they deal with different scenarios. So uh, we rely on their, on their expertise and they, uh, uh, and they um, uh, perform their jobs uh, quite well. From the Canadian Press, Steve. Steve Lambert from the Canadian Press. Uh, Dr. Lucen, so there's no change yet in terms of what, which retail stores can open. And I'm wondering if we're, if we're interested in flattening the curve. We've seen some countries where they took extreme measures and, and managed to almost plunk the curve. Um, how, how long uh, will it be before there are new measures on uh, retail store closings? And, and what is the trigger? We're, we're trying to figure out what would trigger the extra measure. Right, so all of these measures have, um, have always been on the table. We've been reviewing them uh, through, uh, through many of our uh, experts um, and uh, discussing it in, uh, through many uh, departments. So um, uh, we are looking, looking at that. The trigger typically for these type of interventions is sustained community-based transmission. That's the typical trigger. Uh, but we've been way out ahead of this, right? So you typically, uh, in, in public health plans, we typically don't move to suspending classes until we see sustained community-based transmission. Uh, but we were way ahead of that. Um, and we don't typically uh, institute social distancing strategies until we see that sustained community-based transmission. But again, we've been ahead of this. And so moving forward, uh, we're going to continue that trend. We're going to be ahead of things. And so we're looking at all of, uh, uh, all of those options going forward. Okay, and as a follow-up question, um, we're just a few months away now from, from summer. Uh, there are major uh, cultural festivals going on, uh, you know, major music festivals that can attract 10,000-plus uh, people. Um, what would you say to people who have to plan far ahead for these things and are looking at events like uh, Dauphin Country Fest, uh, the Winnipeg Folk Fest, uh, Folk Lorama later in the summer? Yeah, I would say that this is evolving rapidly that we, uh, we don't know uh, where necessarily we're going to be in, uh, come summer. And so we're going to do what we can to protect the health of Manitobans. Uh, but I can't um, uh, tell them exactly what summer is going to look like. We're going to do what we need to do to uh, uh, limit the impact of this virus in, in Manitoba. So they can uh, uh, monitor their symptoms. They should uh, do their roles in uh, social distancing. And uh, we'll have to see how, um, how the trajectory turns out here in, in our jurisdiction. Thank you. From CC Manitoba, Bart. Thank you, this is CDC Manitoba. Uh, Dr. Rissett, why not provide more specific direction to workplaces in the form of a social distancing order within them rather than a recommendation? Yeah, and none of those things are, are off the table. And so as we move forward, uh, things of that nature, um, uh, similar to other jurisdictions, are certainly uh, being contemplated. Uh, and we, uh, we're going to do, we're going to take the steps that we think are, uh, are important to uh, protect the health of Manitobans. Uh, but we also know that health is not only related to this virus. Uh, there's, there's unintended consequences 
uh, to, uh, to taking drastic measures. Um, so we're going to take them, but we're going to do them in an informed way. Um, but we're, we're looking at all of those um, constantly, those options. And Dr. Luthen, uh, different topic. Thank you for providing daily updates on the number of completed and processed tests, as well as the number of tests processed the previous day. How many Manitobans are awaiting their test results right now? That I don't, uh, who are, are waiting to hear whether they were um, negative. It's, it's a really tough, uh, tough number to land on because, uh, you know, uh, as we speak, people are being informed of their, of their results. So um, it's, a, um, it's a tough number to come to, but we've made uh, a lot of inroads to get those results out to people quickly. The lab has um, been literally working day and night to increase its turnaround time increase its capacity and so we are indebted to their uh, to their work because uh, uh, their work's very very important and they've been able to uh, really step up uh, for manitoba well for the reason i ask i'm just trying to put together put to bed rumors that there's a much larger processing backlog than they have been disclosed yeah i don't i don't know what uh, what rumors there are i know that they've uh, they've made um uh, quite a lot of inroads. You can see the number of tests that they're performing now. Uh, and uh, from my um, uh, information, uh, just this week, they're going to be uh, not having a backlog, uh, backlog, that they're going to be back to that 24 to 48 hour test turnaround time. Thank you. And I'll go to Drew from the Brandon Sun. Thank you. This is uh, Drew May the Brandon Sun. Um, Dr. Rizin, perhaps you could just clarify, but as it stands now, out of the 39 cases, how many people are in hospital and how many are just self-isolating at home? Right, so uh, reports to me um, are that uh, almost all of those individuals are at home recovering. Uh, so we've had a hospitalization that was reported to me in the past. That person has been subsequently discharged. Um, as these cases come in, as uh, their status may or may not change. Um, I rely on, on reports from our epidemiology and surveillance department that I get at 9.30 each morning. And so as of that time, I'm not aware of any other admissions. Um, but I, I can tell you that up to now, uh, the vast majority of people have had mild symptoms and recovering at home. Okay, so so far they're all at home? As of the reports okay. to me, yeah, as of the reports to me at 9.30 this morning. Thank you. We'll try now for Denise from Reuters. Yes, hi. Um, I have a question about testing. Uh, I'm wondering if you have adequate testing chemicals like reagents in their province. Well, the, the lab has informed me that they've um, modified some of their process, they've made some workarounds, and so that their capacity has, uh, has increased, and they're back up, you can see, to uh, over 600 case, uh, tests a day that they're running. Uh, they feel that they can increase that capacity um, further. Uh, and so I would, I would say at this point, they've um, they found a way to, uh, to get our capacity up. You said they're they're back uh, they're back up. Um, was there a shortage before? That's correct. the The shortage um, uh, late last week was result was uh, revolving around that worldwide shortage of the reagent. Okay. And second question: um, Where do you source um, this chemical? Where do you source your reagent from? I don't have the details of that. You know, there's there's a number of products that the lab uses, a number of um, uh, lots of technology and processes that they are involved in, highly specialized. So I, I don't know the uh, where they get all these things from. Not that one. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to Michelle from CTV. I have no further questions. 
Okay, thank you. Navi, 102.9. Uh, hello, this is Abby Ball with Learning Tonight. See, Kim, I just have a quick question for Dr. Rusin. Uh, did you mention where in the province the three new probable cases are from? I did not mention uh, because we just got the uh, lab results reported to me uh, this morning. So we've, um, uh, we're committed to um, notifying Manitobans of new cases as soon as we, we know, uh, but I don't have the, the details of those in, in front of me. Those have all been um, out to the regions and uh, actions already been taken, but the, uh, those uh, details aren't in front of me. Okay, um, and a quick follow-up for Lynette. Uh, the the uh, site that's been relocated, is it still just a regular community testing site or is it a drive-through? I believe it's just regular, not a drive-through. Okay, perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Over to Scott from the Winnipeg Sun. Yeah, this one's for, I guess, Dr. Rusin. Uh, there's a probe research poll out today um, saying that younger men are most likely to believe that the, the crisis is overblown. Um, what, what is the message to people, I suppose, that just aren't aiming to, to, to get it at this point? I think that, uh, you know, the, the importance of going to credible information and getting that uh, that message out and that's why um you know we we consider uh, all of you part of our team because you get our our message out um in a, in a credible way and we appreciate that um and so i think it's just the uh, as the trajectory increases we see more and more community spread uh, throughout canada uh, and then unfortunately uh, we have days like this where we um we have a severe outcome um, and it's uh, really disheartening um, but it's, uh, you know, we need all Manitobans to know that now is that time for uh, for action. Uh, we need to take this seriously. Um, and it's not only about you. You put other people at risk uh, if you're not following these social distancing strategies. You're putting our healthcare workers on the front line at risk. You're putting people around you at risk. You're putting yourselves at risk. So um, I want everyone to uh, take the time, uh, go get some credible information manitoba.ca slash COVID-19 and, um, and do your part. Do your part. It's, it's uh, to protect all of us. Thank you. From CJOB, Clay. Money at Global. Um, just a follow-up on the 10-person limit. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, this will be enforced and who enforces it, and what can people do if they see somebody not abiding by that 10-person uh, restriction? Right, so we do have the, uh, uh, the ability to enforce it. Certainly, it's, a, it's an order under the Public Health Act. Uh, so right now, we, um, our public health inspectors are involved, certainly around businesses. Um, we um, uh, will be uh, engaging uh, peace officers, uh, which could be involved in this as well. Uh, but again, you know, I get uh, this is just that one one tool, right? This isn't the this isn't the answer. This isn't our strategy. This is just one tool in our strategy, uh, just helping us get that message out that. This is important. You know, we're, we're going to use um, the powers that we have to protect the health of Manitobans. So now is that time to act. Um, we need people to, to change the way they live. We know it's difficult. We know that uh, a lot of people are, uh, uh, you know, going through some rough times because of this. Uh, but it's for the health of all Manitobans. Uh, protect the people around you. Protect our front care, frontline health care workers. Um, uh, do your part. Stephanie at City News. Stephanie with City News. Just wondering if there's been any progress made in talks on how to help Manitobans who use shelter services where they can't really observe social distancing strategies and they can't observe the 10 people that are last order. Uh, we know it's a challenge. Uh, we are 
working on a strategy that we can help support from the health system in terms of finding space for those people who can't um, self-isolate. Uh, but we're also, uh, I believe there's conversations happening at the local level with um, shelters and, and different organizations in terms of how can they identify more space so that people are a little farther apart and, um, and they can comply with the social distancing recommendations. So that work is ongoing. It is a challenge and, and we're very aware of it and uh, are working to support it. Okay. From CDC Radio Canada, Patrick. Yes, hi, Patrick Foucault from Radio Canada. Um, do, are you aware if any Manitoba recovered from COVID-19? It's a good question and uh, we're going to start reporting on that. Uh, I mentioned that it's, it's not normally an indicator that we, that we report on. Um, but uh, but for this uh, particular condition, we are going to have an indicator set up, and we're going to uh, provide that on our on our website. So we're hoping to have that soon um, to, to start showing Manitobans that one, uh, the majority of people who develop COVID-19 uh, will recover at home. 80% typically will have mild enough symptoms to uh, to recover at home. And so we want to show that um, uh, that hope to Manitobans that now is not the time for fear, but it certainly is the time for action. But we're going to be providing those uh, those type of measures online. Thank you. And and my apologies if you already answered that today, but I was just wondering: Are we so we're not talking yet about uh, community transmission in Manitoba, do we? When we're um, discussing community-based transmission, uh, we are going to be looking for uh, these uh, these cases that might be termed the pop-up cases, that uh, cases we, we can't link to a known transmission chain. Uh, so we have a number of cases that um, uh, uh, were spread from known uh, uh, cases uh, to contacts and so by definition that would be a community spread. It's just when we, when we can link it to a known case um, uh, it's it's uh, not giving us that indication of widespread or sustained community-based transmission. So that's not what we're describing right now. Thank you. Carol from the Winnipeg Free Press. Hi, I'm just, uh, I have another question about lab testing. I'm wondering about, um, Catam Lab is now able to do its own confirmations, right? And I'm just wondering, um, is that affecting how many false positives and negatives you're seeing? No, uh, that will be, uh, they have a strict, uh, st um, strict validity uh, uh, protocols that they have to follow. And so uh, we expect the uh, high uh, sensitivity, high spe specificity uh, from their tests. And so we know that with any test, there can be false negatives and false positives. There's, there's uh, no way around that, um, but they have uh, strict uh, standards there, so we'll, uh, we're relying on, on their results. And, and have they had to validate their processes or procedures with any overseer or any regulatory agency? That's correct, and so that's, uh, that's why they're able to do the in-house confirmation now is because they uh, go through validity testing uh, with the national lab over a number of their first samples. So now that they've run um, many samples, have had positives, had had returned confirmatory results, uh, now they're able to uh, do the in-house confirmation, which is typical of, of many uh, jurisdictions now. From Canadian Press, Steve. Hi, Steve Lambert from the Canadian Press. Um, I'm wondering, we, we hear anecdotes about people observing uh, the guidelines for social distancing and self isolation. We hear anecdotes of some people not doing it. Are, are you getting any data on this subject? Yeah, real tough, uh, uh, tough thing to uh, to measure. You know, certainly. So we are doing what we can to. 
uh, get the message out. We repeatedly try to get that message out. It's on our, our website. Uh, it's uh, in the media, and um, and we continue to try to get the message out. A real tough thing to to actually find an indicator and measure, um, but we'll take whatever steps we uh, we need. So we're enhancing our public health orders uh, to uh, to ensure that Manitobans know that we're taking this seriously. We expect them to take it seriously, um, and from what I uh, see and and hear. Um, many, many Manitobans are, uh, have been taking us seriously right from the beginning. And so uh, we'll thank, uh, thanks out to them. Um, and I think uh, more and more Manitobans will be getting on board to, uh, because we know this, this affects us all. We're, we are truly in this together. And uh, your actions affect other people. And so please, I want everyone to um, understand their role. Now is the time for action. Yeah, understandable that you know the other things that are easier to measure, and there are other things to focus on. But but given that it it would obviously affect the transmission and the spread of the uh, of COVID nineteen, um, are you getting reports of, on individual cases? Uh, are you getting any any data uh, as to an indication as to whether people are taking it seriously completely? Uh, you know, I, I don't know what uh, what uh, data would uh, would look like um, to be able to uh, to really uh, synthesize that and put it together. So, we're going to rely on our on our messaging. We're focused on um, our surveillance, uh, leading us to uh, some modeling numbers uh, dealing with the condition itself. Um, but um, you know, I think there there may be some uh, studies uh, underway looking at. Um, compliance with these type of social distancing strategies, but we are not in a position to be, um, you know, engaged in, in those right now. So we're going to get the message out. We're going to keep getting the message out. We're going to use all the tools we have necessary, such as public health orders. Um, but I'm, uh, we don't have any active data collection on whether, uh, uh, whether who is or who is not f um, complying with uh, social distancing strategies. Over to CBC, Donna Trouble, and Bart. Ms. Sarah Dufa, Bart CBC. Our breast cancer surgeries, uh, prophylactic or otherwise, essential surgeries or non essential? Breast cancer surgeries would be essential. Any cancer, anything that would have bad outcomes uh, over a period of months would proceed as planned. Okay, and this question is for Dr. Rufin. i try to hand the camera back to him. Um, would, what do you think, Dr. Rufin, of the hydroxychloroquine study being conducted at the U of M? How optimistic do you think that would make a difference long term? Well, I think it's, it's important. Uh, I think that right now all of these interventions are, are non-pharmaceutical interventions that we're uh, implementing or case identification, contact tracing, social distancing strategies. Uh, so if we could get a, a effective pharmaceutical intervention on top of that, then that would um, you know, change our approach uh, and certainly we would hope improve outcomes. So um, all of these studies are very important. It's very early. Um, so we we need to be cautiously optimistic of that, but uh, I know the the researchers uh, that are working on this are um, uh, world class, and so I'm uh, really thankful that they've been able to uh, jump onto these uh, studies, and we're going to be uh, cautiously optimistic to the uh, outcomes of them. And, and super briefly, I know you don't work for the NML, but what is the nature of the research that the core people there are doing on the virus? The, uh, at the NML, what kind of uh, research they are doing? I, I can't speak specifically to what, uh, what they are looking at. Okay, thanks. Glad you might know. Thanks. Over to the Brandon Sun and Drew. Uh, thank you. Um, this is uh, Drew with the Brandon Sun. Um, perhaps just quickly, but uh, I would say now, is the biggest concern here about people from other provinces coming and potentially spreading COVID-19, or is the focus still on people from other countries who are traveling to Manitoba? Well, certainly international travel is the, is the biggest risk right now, certainly from the U.S. That would be a, a, an important risk factor. And so now those people are under quarantine orders uh, for 14 days as they return. 
um, as we see more and more community-based transmission around us and uh, provinces surrounding us, uh, then that's uh, increasing in, in risk as well. So that's why um, all the returning interprovincial travelers must self-isolate for 14 days um, with few uh, limitations. Uh, and we're uh, doing what we can to get that message out. Um, so certainly uh, now is not the time to travel. So we're strongly um, are urging Manitobans to cancel or postpone non-essential travel. This is the time to stay home. This is not the time to travel. Uh, but if you're returning to our province from outside of our province, you need to self-isolate for 14 days. If it's internationally, you're going to be under that quarantine order, so you're going to be quarantined for 14 days. Um, but uh, we need all Manitobans to know their, their part. If, if for whatever reason you're returning to our province, self-isolate 14 days, monitor for those symptoms of respiratory illness. If you get sick, call Health Links. Thank you. Release from Reuters. All right, we have time for a few more questions. Uh, anybody want to jump in? Go ahead. Hello, this is Nabi Baldwin, 1029CHTM. Uh, I just have another question for Dr. Brent Brucen. Um, what is the province's definitive plan for homeless shelters? Because uh, I repeat reports that the city of Thompson has been trying to contact the province on this for a couple of weeks now. I know, I know the question was for me. I think that uh, uh, Lynette will probably have a better, better answer, but we've been working with, uh, uh, with a number of these uh, organizations. We've uh, set up a, a process, certainly with uh, uh, confirmed cases or those needing to isolate to be able to go to uh, um, uh, another area uh, uh, to allow that to happen. So I don't know, Lynette, if you... Yeah, I would say, Abby, uh, if it's um, a homeless shelter in the north specifically, uh, we are developing some guidelines and, and I can certainly share that with the Northern Regional Health Authority. If the homeless shelter that you're speaking of wants to make that connection, we can, we absolutely will support. Perfect, thank you. Anyone else? Oh, the key was here one more, if I may. Um, Dr. Rusin, do what is the indication that we have about uh, the numbers of people getting tested who are domestic travelers versus international travelers since the province uh, made the quarantine order, or recommendation rather, for returning domestic travelers? The amount that are being tested uh, with the various uh, travel, we, we don't really have a way of tracking that. That would have to be uh, listed on the requisition uh, by the uh, healthcare provider taking the test. So often we, we don't have that information provided to us. Um, you know, certainly it'll come in a, uh, in a contact investigation should it be positive, but we don't uh, have a way of tracking that for all the negative tests, how many negative tests included uh, interprovincial travel, so we, uh, I don't have anything to report on that. Any uh, follow-up questions at this time? All right, thank you very much, everyone. That concludes today's COVID-19 media briefing.